the stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be your Chicken Shaw native, your Chicken Shaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we got a treat today. If you have, there's a title that is in Puerto Rico. He held it about 34 times. He was a multi-time Puerto Rican <laughs> heavyweight champion, tag team champion. I, I couldn't even add it all up, and I had like uh, ten fingers and ten toes. I was trying to count with. He is simply Mr. Ricky Santana. He was an agent for WWE for WCW. One of the good guys in the business. Ricky, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, JBL, and, and Gerald. You know, uh, he's he's to blame for a few of my uh, uh, mishaps and a few of my uh, earlier day ribs that I was. Uh, uh, fortunate enough to uh, get into, to be quite honest. Um, and I think that's what built the relationship and the bond, you know. Um, I was starting out, you know, I come from the Malenko school, but when I finally met Gerald, it was when, you know, Vince was buying everything and, and WWF was, was exploding. And he happened to see in Poughkeepsie, we were doing TV, and he saw my name was next to Greg Valentine's. So he goes, come here, kid. I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, I need you to do me a favor. I said, uh, yes, sir. He says, I see you're working with Greg. You know, he gives that big forearm, right? I said, yeah. He says, do me a favor. When he hits you, just say something, but don't be disrespectful. You know what I mean? Just kind of cute. I said, okay, you know, I want to be part of the team. So I go out there and then Greg rears back with that. And he hit me. And I just kind of looked at him and said, that's it? And his <laughs> eyes went, what? He proceeded to pummel me into the ground, right? So I'm, you know, in Poughkeepsie, you got to come down to three flights of stairs to get to the locker room. So you know, the the superstar stays in the ring. The enhancement uh, gets out first. Right? So I'm going down the steps. I hear that door fling open, and I hear it. Him running down the stairs, and I get to the bottom, and there's the Briscoes, there's the Funk, and Steamboat, and Craig goes. Oh, kid, I knew you weren't that stupid. I just want to know who put you up to it. Was it the Briscoes? Was it the <laughs> Funk? Or was it Steamboat? And I said, I'm not allowed to, uh, you know, give up my sources, so I'll plead the fifth. <laughs> I walked away. So that kind of started the, the, the bond between me and Jerry. Uh, you know, I made that mistake again with somebody else that we had started to mention um, when we were, before we went on the air with, with Haku. Uh, we're in Mexico and it's a six man. And I told the guys, Hey, I'll start. I'll get them warmed up. So we tie up and I said, Hey, big man, why don't you give me one of those chops that everybody's afraid of? So he hits me and I know it. And I go, really? That's it. And he eyes and his nose flared up and he, he gave me two more. And I go, man, you hit like such a pussy. And he really got riled up, and he gave me about nine of them in a row. And I backed into the corner, and I said, brother, brother, do I owe you money? I'm not the promoter, you know? And he started laughing. And I said, brother, no, no, hit me out. Bill, 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 boo. I tagged, and I said, he's warmed up, boys. He's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and they all looked at me like, oh, gee, thanks. Thanks, I appreciate that. But, yeah. It's uh, it's one of those things that uh, you know back in the day that was you know infamous. But, but Ricky, uh, Ricky, Ricky, go ahead and tell him what else I told you about uh, you know becoming a star. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, growing up, you know, I moved to Florida and it was championship wrestling from Florida it was on every week, and you know, I was into it, right? But Gordon Soley being Gordon Soley putting over all the talent. But over in that time in that territory, everybody was amateurs, you know. You had, you know, people like Bob Roop, Saido, Danny Hodge, Hiro Matsuda. And, of course, you know, you're going to mention the Briscoes. So, to me, I said, damn, you know, if I want to be a pro wrestler, I'm going to have to sit there and be an amateur. So, <laughs> that's what I did, you know. But nobody told me you would have to be cutting weight and running bleachers and missing Thanksgiving dinners for the next seven years. So then when I finally got into it, I find out it was a work. So I tell Jerry, I said, Jerry, you got heat with me, man. I missed all these dinners. And he said, yeah, but uh, what did you say you wanted to be? I go, a pro wrestler. He goes, and what did you become? I go, a pro wrestler. He goes, well, I guess that shit worked then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was one of those things. But, you know, he did tell me when we were in WWF that, 
you know, um, I needed to go out and hone my talent because, you know, there was everybody and everybody in the business was there at that time. And I told him, I said, hey, you know, I, I don't know anybody like that. I'm not second generation. And, you know, this is like the mafia. It's not, you know, what you know, it's who you know. So uh, Jerry tells me, listen, gives me a number. He says, you call this number tomorrow at four o'clock. Not at 359, not at 401, four o'clock. You got it, kid? Absolutely. So next day, well, I wait, four o'clock on the button, ringing. Jerry picks up. He goes, yeah, listen, you got a pen? I said, yeah. And he says, Chavo Guerrero just took over the book in San Antonio. So you need to call him tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Not 2.59, not 3.01. You need to call him at 3 o'clock. And I'm going, okay, all right. Uh, thanks, Jerry. And I hang up the phone and I go, well, why didn't you just give me Chavo's number to start with? But he was grooming to make sure that I could follow direction. And that was something that was, you know, uh, very formidable for me when I first got out to San Antonio and, and Chavo was there and he, he asked me, he says, Briscoe says you're pretty good. You know, you're a Florida boy. He got trained in Malenko school. I said, yeah, all that's true. He goes, can you cut a promo? Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. I can cut a promo. I never cut a promo in my life. He goes, okay, there's, there's the clock. There's the five towns. You got two minutes, everything, every, every bit in every town. I get there and it's 158. And I said to myself, shit, that's pretty good. First time, 158. He'd come over to me and he goes, are you fucking kidding me? I gave you two minutes and you didn't even utilize it. How do you expect me to get you over if you don't want to get yourself over? You know, maybe you should go back to Florida. Maybe Briscoe's fucking wrong. You don't know shit. I'd respect you if you went two minutes and two seconds. What do you got to say? I said, um, can I do it over? Uh, you think you can? Uh, I think I can. Boop, boop, boop. I went two minutes and two seconds. <laughs> he looked at me and he goes, you're a smart ass, but you know how to follow direction. And, and that started it. And I picked his brain for the next nine to 10 months, every night, I'll, you know, while we did things in the psychology of the business, you know, back in the territory days and, you know, running around and, it was, uh, Texas is big, let me tell you. <laughs> you do a lot yeah. of driving. For sure. uh, so Rick, Ricky, let's back up a little bit. You know, back sure. back, back in the days where you talked about the amateur wrestling, when, when did I, I, I read a story, uh, an interview that you did. Your dad used to take you to wrestling, one of your big thrills when you were performing there. You got to buy him a ticket. And he, he went out and showed you. He did a typical Santana deal. He was signing all the grass fillers selling your spot. Like <laughs> yeah. That. But but take us back. Take us back to the beginning. When did the spark go in? Hey, I want to be one of those guys. Uh, you know, uh, we were in New York, and my dad would take us to the garden. Uh, Bruno um, was the, the main guy for so many years there. And this particular night in the summertime, it was Bruno against uh, George Steele. And I was sitting there and we were watching the matches and a couple of young guys that, you know, went on. One is the Hall of Famer, which is Carlos Colon, was against Johnny Rods, you know, who trained a lot of guys. But for me, I was more fascinated on how the characters in the ring had everybody's emotions, you know, how they would cheer for the baby face and how they would, you know, be mad at the heel for doing stuff. So I said to me, I said, man. Look how they have control of everybody. Look how they tell a story. And, you know, I knew it would frustrate me or make me happy and everything else. So, you know, I kept having my dad because, you know, they ran it once a month. He'd go into the garden. And then we moved to Florida. And I said, oh, well, shit, there's <laughs> there's no, no Madison Square Garden here. So back then, um, in in, in TV land, it was only the three main channels and the main networks, PBS, and then the UHF, which was channel 23, which is now Univision. But back then on Sundays, they would show a four-hour block of wrestling. The first hour was from the Olympic out in L.A. Then they would go to um, Oklahoma, and then they would go to the Carolinas, which was all tags at that time. And the last one was obviously Florida Championship Wrestling. And it was the way the story was written and the characters that really enticed me in Florida to pursue it. And, you know, wrestle in high school, junior high, you know, and all those good things. 
to actually, you know, follow up. And that's what's got me going. I remember the first time I stepped into the ring, um, it was uh, with a uh, a veteran of, of the Florida Territory in the sense uh, he wasn't, you know, he was just uh, underneath guy, but his name was Steve Brody. I'm sure you remember him, uh, Jerry. And uh, he called the international spot for me, you know, untack would drop down, get it again. And I dropped down and I stood up and I froze. He kicked me in the gut, snapped me over, and he says, forgot the spot, kid. I said, yeah, no shit. God, what an ass I am. I said, but I promise you, I'll never forget another spot or finish in my life. And that's what I tried to base my learning experiences in the in the business to be able to do that and remember everything and do all those things. But, you know, it was Florida Championship Wrestling. It was your brother Jack. You know, he was there. I was, I was in Miami Beach when he dropped it to Terry. And then Terry was instrumental in sending me to Japan. You know, you sent me to San Antonio. So everybody that I watched, and then Dusty gave me my first big break, you know, working, you know, uh, you know, in that middle of the top with, you know, the, the best of talent in the business. So all the guys that I watched growing up, I got a chance to step into the ring with and, and become that, you know. Well, how, how did you find about Malenko? I mean, what was your step to getting to, from Miami to Tampa? Right out of high school? Or when did you, when did you take uh, well, out? Well, I, I I was sitting there, and there was uh, uh, a gentleman who had wrestled enhancement in the 50s in the Carolina. His daughter went to school with me. And um, she kind of, you know, he used to have ringside tickets at the armory in Fort Lauderdale. So when I went down there, some of the guys, I guess, knew him or he knew some of the guys, and they kept looking. So I asked him, you know, do you know these guys? And he said, you got a minute. He had a ring in his backyard. And in his backyard, there was – a ring set up. So he was, you know, talking to me about it and this, that, and the other. And the Miami Herald did an article on it. So through the article uh, is where I met um, Malenko when he opened up another school down in South Florida in, in Davie. And that's when I went to go train with uh, the great Malenko. And, you know, it was a little... Um, Difficult at first, not dragging your feet, because that's what you do when you're an amateur. You know, you drag your feet in a circle instead of, you know, you don't ever cross over your feet when you're amateur because you'd be taken down. So, but, so wait, back, back up there. So you 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 took our advice. You went out for amateur wrestling. What what kind of athlete were you in high school? Were you a standout athlete? or, or how uh, Yeah, I, was, I, was, I wasn't a state champ, but, you know, I placed in the in the districts and the, the regional and, and all that. Um, what was tough for me is that, you know, I, uh, I had played uh, – football on the offensive line as a as a tackle but the only weight that was open was 157 wow so I, would, wow. So I would come from like 190 to 157 you know every year for four years and uh, you know i could have been as tall as bradshaw but i think it's not my growth <laughs> <laughs> hey when did you get the advice from jerry about being an amateur wrestler oh wow well, from gordon uh, on the on the <laughs> tv he kept hey, saying, John, hey, John, we, you, we you know. used to preach that. I mean, Florida, yeah. high, uh, Ricky, uh, high school wrestling was just starting in, in Florida. Yeah. So uh, Eddie, Eddie was behind it, financing programs all over the state. Eddie would get, he like Ricky said, he loaded up his territory with a bunch of college wrestlers, and he preached it because his son, Mike, was going through. Orton was kind of a permanent resident. Bobby Orton was here. Yeah. He was going through. All those, all those Florida guys were, were Jimmy Garvin. All of them were just starting amateur wrestling down there. So, Eddie, Eddie every night, he every, every TV show, he would basically have a segment where one of the amateur wrestlers would go out and tell kids like Ricky, "Hey, man, you want to yeah. be up here? Start go to your high school wrestling coach and get get a board there." So he really did a lot for amateur wrestling. There. Yeah, and and that's the way it was always, you know, broadcasted. Gordon had, you know, he would put all the accolades in there, you know, he, when, if it was Danny Hodge, you know, he would say Danny Hodge was, you know, NCAA champion, AAU boxing champion, you know, uh, the Briscoes NCAA champions, Bob Roop, you know, uh, Greco Roman champion, you know, and Basta Saido silver medalist. And then the list went on and on and on. So to me, you know, I just assumed that that was, that, that was the case, you know, if I would have known that I could have stayed fat and been a heavyweight. I would have <laughs> <done that. laughs> Hey, Ricky, the international spot, because I wrestled for Otto, and I, I saw what you did, too, uh, over in uh, Europe. 
we, yes. we, we had a different, it was, it was a different spot. The international there was uh tackle, drop down, leapfrog, hip toss. You're, you're yeah. tackle, drop down, get it again. Yeah. <laughs> so same, yeah. I mean, but the international is so, so it was because I'd never heard it used in the States before. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh went over for auto and it, you know, when I first went out, you know, they do the ceremony and they got it around and the circus music played. And I thought it was a rib, you know. But then I said, man, somebody forgot to take the spring down on the the ring here. And the guy goes, no, man, that's how it is. And for me, you know, I called the spot my first night in, backdrop. And that was the last time I called backdrop. Oh, those you know? rings were so hard. Are they? Yeah. Were, it was It was like concrete. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where, which, which cities did you work for auto? Uh, Bremen was the major city that I was in there. We did some stuff in Frankfurt and some little small town. But what really blew me away is, you know, we had the gym sponsorship, right? That where the boys could train. And I went to the gym to go work out and I see there's a full blown bar inside the gym and they're smoking cigarettes and drinking beer. And I said, yeah, oh, okay, this is a little different, but all right, whatever. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I used to see the same thing. It was great. You'd have you'd have like a Gold's Gym, like the equivalent, and you'd have a bar. And people would sit there and smoke some cigarettes, have a beer, then go work out, then they'd come back and drink another beer. A little bit. Yeah, it was perfect setup, you know. <laughs> it was great. So so you worked your way up to Malenko now. So how yeah. long was you how, who was with you at Malenko's and was Jody and, and Dean there, Shelly, doing a lot of uh, Jody and Dean were there. Um, the main crew of guys was uh, Tugboat, um, Paul Diamond, myself. You had Rusty Brooks. Um, you had uh, Red Roberts there. He was another guy from South Florida. Right, yeah. uh, Norman Smiley, he came into the picture. Doc, Dr. 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 Red Roberts, right? Yes, Dr. Red Roberts, yeah, yes, that, that. yes. And then Norman Smiley and, um, you know, those are the guys that would do all the, you know, all of Malenko shows at the boys club. And well, what, what kind of, what kind of guy was Norman Smiley? Cause man, I mean, everybody just loved Norman. Was he, was he like that when he was in that school? Was he just a jovial guy? Really, really good guy. Oh yeah. He was from the beginning. And I knew Norman from uh, his bodybuilding days, um, yeah. down in South Florida because I had a, a, a um, uh, tights company, you know, Zuba type of things for the yeah. NPC. And he competed in those contests. And, you know, that's that's where I first met him. And then he got into wrestling. And I see him, you know, with us with Malenko. So it's just, you know, he was the same guy from the bodybuilding to that till, till this day, even when I see him, you know, Norman's Norman. Norman's you know, the big Norman. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy. So how long did you lay there? And how, where, where did you go from there? Did, is that when you went to got side with New York? What? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I did all the, the, the well, it was called Outlaw back then. Um, but yeah. We did all that until uh, we got a break. There was a gentleman who was who was uh, working with us. His name was Joe Mascaro. They happened, you know, he knew gorgeous George Jr. who happened to know George Scott. And they were looking for the enhancement talent people. And, uh, you know, they set it up. And that's when we, you know, went up there. And we, you know, they'll call the Florida crew. And uh, it was myself, Joe Murdo, Rusty Brooks, uh, Jimmy Young, and, and Corporal Krishna. He was going as R.T. Reynolds back then. And it was one of those things that you you, you kind of, you said, yes, you know, here I am. You know, I was fortunate enough to, number one, be Savage's first match, uh, Bret Hart's first match. Uh, when Terry Funk beat up Melvin because he put his hat on, that was me in the ring with him. So, you know, we got to work the loop, too. Because every time they came into Florida, they would use us. Um, sometimes they would send us when they were doing TV in, in Hamilton and use us there or right around the New York area, White Plains and things. So it was going pretty good. You know, I was making, you know, decent living. And, you know, then you sent me to San Antonio and I worked seven days, you know, on top pretty much. It was Okay, it was San Antonio, I got to ask you this question here. You yeah. ran into a, a future Hall of Famer, multi Hall of Famer. There actually probably had one of his first program matches, right, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Shawn Michaels, <laughs> he was there, <laughs> and he was eighteen. And um, you know, when I when I got there, he was there, and Tugboat was there. Tugboat helped me out because of him and Paul, because I didn't have anywhere to live. I got there with nothing but you know twenty bucks in my pocket, which was the funny part because Chavo says, you know. 
uh, I have somebody pick you up. Just pay for your ticket or reimburse you when you get here. So I did that, and I had 20 bucks in my pocket, and I waited at the airport for about five hours, Jerry. <laughs> and I had always, I'd always bought a round-trip ticket because that's what I was taught. I always have a way to go home. And I walked over. And I said, this is my break. I'm going to I'm gonna ride the wave out. And they had all those hotels where you pick up the phone and they give you the shuttle. So this was a, a travel lodge, and it was $16.95 with a free continental breakfast. So I said, okay, that'll go. Boom. So, you know, I go there. And the next morning I call the office because it was Monday and travel answered. And I said, hey, you know, bud, nobody picked me up. I was here um, yesterday. And he goes, well, where are you at now? And I wanted to rib him, you know. So I, <laughs> so I said, well, shit, you know, trouble. I, I flew back home. But then I figured, well, what if he says stay home? So yeah. he goes, what? I go, no, no, never mind. Just kidding. I'm at the travel lodge over here. And he said, oh, okay, I'll send somebody over to pick you up. You know, and then went over to the junction. And uh, like I said, it was an interesting territory because, you know, you'd go to Odessa every other week. It was just 385 miles one way. You go to the valley every Sunday. On Mondays, you'd go out to Beaumont, which is on the other side of Houston. We'd wow. go as far north uh, and go into Lawton, Oklahoma. We would do Wichita Falls, which is, you know, right next door to Dallas, where, you know, JBL was, you know, figure stay there for a while. But, yeah, it was, oof. I told Aaron Anderson that one time. I said, you know, Chow had a good relationship with, um, with Bill Watts. And sometimes when they'd run Houston, you know, he would take some of the guys that – and I said, yeah, that was, you know, the deal at Mid-South. I said, I was on a 3000 uh, a week guarantee. And Arn goes, they were paying you three grand a week? I said, no, no, 3,000 miles, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to drive 3,000 miles. I didn't goes, realize oh, that territory was that big. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in Mid-South, your TV's in Oklahoma, and then you have to – you would deadhead all the way back into like Shreveport or something, right. you know. I mean, but I'm in San Antonio, going from Beaumont. Oh yeah, all the way to Lawton, yeah. all the way out to West. That's huge. Yeah, every other week was Odessa. It was like you know, 385 miles. I remember it's like, geez, you know, go to Beaumont. You know, same thing, 300 miles. The Valley, 300 miles. And there's nothing on the roads. There's nothing there. I grew up out no, there. I saw, no, I saw. I saw the largest rattler go across the. The middle of the interstate looked like a movie, you know, a Clint Eastwood <laughs> movie. And I said, damn, he was a whole, whole plane. And I go, I got big ass snake in me. He said, yeah. Those are them West Texas Rattlers. Everything's big in Texas. I said, uh, Ricky, yeah. Ricky, Ricky, we, we've had, you know, Scott Cowboy, Scott Casey, right? Oh, yes, yes. He was there with me in San Antonio. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He was there with you in San Antonio. Did you yeah. ever hear the flying saucer story? No, I've never heard of one. <laughs> so we're not He's saying kind of this. We're not saying it didn't happen, Ricky. Okay. <laughs> we think there might have been some imbibing and things that went on on the trip. So, and, and you, uh, when you, when been. you, when you hear all the passengers in the car, you'll know it was something going on in there. God <laughs> knew who all was. Well, it was Wahoo, right? <laughs> Wahoo, uh, Scott Casey. Scott. Yeah, Mil Mil Moscaris and yeah. who was the other one? Uh, Tom, uh, Tom uh, Jones, Tom, 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 Tom Jones, yeah, Tom Jones, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he claimed he claimed that the saucer landed next to him. <laughs> now, Rick, you were not making this up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Scott, listen, I talked to Scott about it since I saw him in Dallas recently at, at Black Bart's uh, fundraiser, and he tells me he goes that was a true story. So it, it, he's. He is, uh, they said yeah, the saucer was... landed and they sat there and watched it and Wahoo wanted to get out and talk to him. And Scott told him, if you do, I'll kill you. And so Wahoo just ended up kept going and we, we have no verification of any of it. So I reached out to uh, someone who knew uh, Alberto Del Rio's dad, Dos Carol, who's Mill's brother, yes. but right. and, Dos, and Dos had never heard of it. So I know. Yes. I haven't yeah, been able to get it down to a million. That must have been one hell of a trip. <laughs> <Yeah. That must've laughs> been, <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> but they ended up going down to the 7-Eleven, buying them a case of beer and sending them along their way. <laughs> no, I did have it. <laughs> That's always it, a peacekeeper. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so you, you've never heard the UFO story? 
No, no, and I've heard a lot of stories, but I ain't never heard the UFO. So I've witnessed a few stories, and some of them were woo, way out there. But needless to say, yeah, I, no, well, that's you, a new you, one. You know, made two characters, Wahoo and Scott. I mean, anything can happen in their <laughs> life, and usually does. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure, on Wahoo. I know that. <laughs> Was that Joe Blanchard's territory then? Uh, it was Joe, and they sold it out to Fred Barons, who made it um, Texas All Star. And um, then uh, guys would come in and out, like you know, like Wahoo and the and the Sheepers, the Bushwhackers, and guys from Watson's territory, uh, DiBiase, One Man Gang. Uh, we did a joint show called The Battle of the Alamo, and then Chavo went to Japan, and then everything changed. Everything changed. Uh, all of a sudden, Gary Hart was the Booker. And we went from having heat to be able to sit next to the marks and have a beer, and they wouldn't even know. We uh, dropped uh, the mask because we were doing a uh, uh, a mask gimmick. Myself and Tony Torres, who was a referee at one time for Bill Watts, and we were the same size, thing, you know, skin complexion and everything else. So we would do the uh, twin doubles switching gimmick all the time. But yeah, he had us drop the mask, the belts first. Then the mask and the Lucy Leaf Town all within a month, <laughs> one right after another. But I remember that Wahoo had been in and he said, you know, when you're done, you know, I'm booking in Florida, just, you know, give me a call. So I could read the writing on the wall and uh, I gave him a call and uh, I said, I'm going to go talk to Gary. He says, well, here's here's the date. If, if you don't get what you want to hear, you know, I got your pencil down. If something changes, let me know. So I went there and. He had us working one day a week, which was TV, which paid 15 bucks. And I said, I got to live. And I said, I'm going to Florida, right? So, you know. So, so now, be, before you leave for Florida, tell us a little bit about a young Shawn Michaels. What Could you see or could you feel it in the ring that this guy had it or what? He had it. Um, he had that, 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 that factor that he was that type of player. Um, he did bust his ass. You know, sometimes, you know, and I've told Sean to his face, you know, sometimes you were a prima donna. And we oh, had really? To. <laughs> yeah. And we had to, because I remember one time we were setting up for a tag, for the tag titles. They had to, you know, get a victory over us, you know, the old school to get a title shot at the at the big show. And, uh, you know, we bumped for him for about 10 minutes, all their double team high spots and everything else. And um, he was supposed to get some color. So, you know, we get him going, and I guess he went and got a good one. So he panicked because it was pumping. And then he went to put the blade back in his trunk and cut himself there, too. <laughs> so he was bleeding from his trunk, from his head, and he screams at Paul, tag in, come in, come in, come, come in. He's going to me, go home, go home, go home. I said, no, nah, bro, we've been bumping for 10 minutes. We're going to get our heat before we go anywhere. Don't worry. We won't let you die. We won't let you die. And it was in there, and we finally, you know, we did the finish and did everything we were supposed to. But, you know, when it was time to go, he was, you know, Sean being Sean, and Sean took care of Sean. But he had the talent. You could see that. He was uh, the mainstream when they were doing the interviews. He was the guy that did the speaking for him. You know, he, he knew how to get his baby face roll over. And, uh, you know, we knew how to create the heat, you know, by, you know, talking the smack that heels used to do back then. And, uh, yeah, he, uh, you know, he developed into what he is, you know, the talent, the mind and everything else. But you could see it. You know, he was young. And I said, ah, this this guy's a natural. You know, he uh, he was that. But, you know, it, it's those things, you know, maybe, you know, some other people would say other things. But, you know, give his due. You know, he took care of you. You, you, you can feel the kid had it and would, would be a star one day. No, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And when he was going to Vern's territory, because he was leaving, um, Tugboat was heading to Memphis with Paul Diamond, and I was heading to Florida. Tony was heading back to go with Watts in Houston. So, yeah, everybody was was peeling and, and leaving, but you knew. He told Paul that he was going to come back, you know, he's going to go in there first as a single and then bring him up, because they were a pretty good tag team. But, you know, then they brought in Marty Jannetty and the Midnight Rockers were born, and that was the end of that story. So tell us about your trip to Florida. Well, as I get there, you know, Wahoo was a guy that booked me, but by the time I got there, within a week's time, it went from Wahoo to Kevin to Bob Roop. Was this after <laughs> after Daddy Eddie's death? Or what? Yes, just just right after Eddie's death, um, I was uh, I was 
Yeah, it was early 86, early 86. And um, we were in there and I got my first match, you know, sportatorium, you know, you're thinking, wow, I made it to the sportatorium, you know, here I am, I watched this as a kid. And I go, oh, this is the sportatorium. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, Charlie well. Lay. <laughs> yeah. Charlie Lay was at the front desk, you know, and he told yeah, me. Push, hey, push your old glasses up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here, it's time to cheat, kid, you know, straight back, ba 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 ba, you know. But I had gotten in um, Tuesday night and uh, to wrestle in Tampa, but I didn't know TV was, you know, 7.30 in the morning. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, after the show, everybody went, uh, you know, Papa's, and, you know, here I come strolling in, and it's, you know, I get back at 5 o'clock, and I go, oh, man, I got I to gotta, get the TV at 7.30. I want to make a good impression. Yeah. So who do I get? First time coming through, I get my old tag team partner, Dave Sierra, Cuban assassin, right? <laughs> so I look at it, and I go, hmm, Cuban assassin. Okay, I'm Cuban there. A lot of guys had gimmicks that, you know, they weren't. The Russians weren't really Russian, you know, and, you know, some of these guys, the only ones that really were were the Japanese that were really Japanese. But, you know, for the most part, you know, the Germans went to Germans, you know, it was just one of those things. So I get in the ring and I look across and I go, he don't look Cuban to me. If anything, he looks Mexican, right? And he just kind of, I said, he's got the fatigues in the beard. Uh, you know, I guess that's probably why they gave him the gimmick. So he ties up. And he goes, hey, kid, uh, give me an arm drag. So I thought he was Mexican. So I gave him a Mexican arm drag. And all I hear is, what the fuck was that? Ties back up. Boom, 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 boom. We do our thing. On the way to Miami Beach, I got him again because he was coming through to go to Japan. And Fonzie goes, uh, here's the finish. Ba, 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 ba. He says, in Cuban, uh, wants me to ask you a question. And I said, okay, shoot. He says, do you know who Jack Briscoe is? I go, what, do I live under a rock or some shit? Who doesn't know who Jack Briscoe is? He goes, he wants you to make sure you know who Jack Briscoe is. I said, tell him I know who Jack Briscoe is. So get in the ring, he tie up, and he says, Fonzie, talk to you. I said, yeah, you know who Jack Briscoe is? I say, yeah, just like I told Fonzie, who doesn't know who Jack Briscoe is? And he said, well, then give me a Jack Briscoe arm drag. And I did the bridge and straight over the top. And he goes, now we can work, kid. You know, <laughs> oh, we've been partners for 40 years, it seems like, up and down the road, you know, in the territory, <laughs> overseas. So the first arm drag, was it the right arm? Well, no, I got to the one knee and I kind of, you know, how they do it in Mexico. It yeah, was yeah, yeah. That, that, and I, I I yanked him, you know, because he was he was he wasn't coming over. He was going to take his own bump, but I yanked him, and he he got sideways on me. He gave me a little tater on the receipt end for it, but that was in the there. But then yeah, then I I gave him the Briscoe arm drag, and it was nice and pretty. He was happy. But yeah, we've been you know we've been part so of so that, that that was the first time you met Dave, or did had you met him? Before? No, that was the first time I had met Dave, and. Yeah. Um, you know, in that Florida territory. And yeah. he was just, like I said, he was just coming through. He was going through to Japan. Because I think at that time he was out in Portland. So he was he was there. You know, that was his uh, his baby's nest. And, and mine was Puerto Rico. So, yeah. you know, we kind of helped each other out, you know, in different times, going to different places. Because he's the first guy that got me booked to go out to, um, to Portland when I got my notice uh, in Florida from Bob because I let the Marauder give me a hip toss out of the corner. Um, I went from seven days a week to two. And uh, Ch <laughs> Charlie yeah, Lee, that, that that was so unfortunate. Florida, you know, that, that after yeah. any death, I mean, things just really went south on them. Man, all the talent yeah. was gone. They didn't have anything. They had very few TV. They had very, very, very little fun. Yeah, it, 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 it just, the territory. They fought their ass off, but they just couldn't handle it. Yeah, we, we I mean, we tried to do everything we could, you know, and, and I remember it was it was it was TV and they was pushing me and Tyree Pride as the um, Caribbean connection. He yeah. wanted to you know do the Florida straps on us. The Bahama was, champion, Tyree Pride. Yeah, and it, it was it, it, you know, is, Ty, is Tyree still around or what? Yes, yeah, he's still he's down in South Florida. He's still yeah, around. Yeah. yeah, he's still around. But uh, Marauder says, "Hey, can I just give you a hip toss?" And when you pop up and I turn around, just close on me. 
I said, yeah, I didn't think nothing of it. Boom. So when I saw the two bookings, I said, uh, he, Charlie says, what's wrong, kid? And I said, I went from seven to two. And he goes, yeah, it's not, it's not a good sign. <laughs> and I said, is Bob in? And he says, yeah, he's upstairs. So, you know, I went upstairs and I asked him, I said, do I need to look for someplace else to go? Absolutely. And I said, can you tell me why? And he said, well, you let a guy who hides under a mask hip toss you out when I'm pushing you and another guy for a major title here in this territory and you didn't take care of yourself. So you need to learn a lesson the hard way. And I learned the hard way. TV was mine. I, I, I learned it the hard way. And I, you know, Dave got me booked in, in, in Portland and, and that was, you know, a whole different mentality of, of well, that, that, that was a that was a blessing for you when you went out to Portland, wasn't it? What about what yes. a trip, man? Uh, tell us a little bit about your Portland experience. Uh, the, the Portland was was all the trips were pretty short except for one, which was uh, Medford, which every other week, or when you had to go into Idaho to Lewiston. But you know, Monday night was McMinnville. You know, Tuesday you were you were pretty close to Roseburg, or you would do a special on for in Portland. Wednesday would be Medford. Thursday was Salem. Every Friday was Eugene, and Saturday was was TV. And then Sunday you do a coast town, Coos Bay, or something along those lines. But it was a great territory. Um, when I first got there, uh, I went in and did the, the the TV and everything. But I went to Eugene, and that was Elton's town. And um, I get there, and the babyface locker room. You had to go outside so the other guys could change because it was a shower, a toilet, and two seats. <laughs> the heels had the big dressing room. So I go out and come back. I change in a minute, and Elton walks in. He goes, hey, kid, uh, you from Florida? I said, yeah, that's where I'm from. He goes, yeah, a lot of good shooters in Florida. Can you shoot? I said, I guess I can hold my own. He goes, good, because, uh, you know, we have a little mini shoot here. You know, 20 to the winner and, and 10 to the loser, first two minutes of the match. Okay, I'll be watching. And they walk out and I look at the guys. I go, is he for real? I mean, is it the first two minutes of shoot? He goes, no, he just thinks it's a shoot. What we do is we work it <laughs> and, we, and we split it. Both guys get 15 each. I said, oh, okay. He says, it's beer money. I said, yeah, I get it. So I go out there and this was. Um, I think the last name was War Eagle. Johnny was in there and he he tied up me because I'm putting you over quick. Kid. Take me down. Fire me carry. Boom, boom, hook, boom. Let me up. And that was the end of it, you know? And I said, damn, I was pretty quick. <laughs> so I get back and Elton walks in. He goes, hey, son of a bitch, you're a pretty good shooter. That was the quickest I've ever seen him go down. Whoa, who trained you, you know? <laughs> I was sent out. I went to the Malinkos and the Bristols have a hand in it. Go, oh, no wonder some bitches can shoot. You know, that was, that was the end of that. You know, but it, it was a constant work. But it was a, it was a fun territory. Uh, when I first went out there the first time, uh, Rip Oliver was, was booking. And uh, they were out there. And I had gone out there at a time where he needed some you know, some baby face talent because most of the guys that were there were, you know, just starting out like Brady Boone and Scott Doring and Scotty the Body was a heel out there. A lot of a lot of young guys out there starting to, to go. But, you know, Don Owens was uh, always good to me. Don Owens, uh, along with Paul Bosch, in those territory days, one of the best payoff guys in the business, you know, and he was he was funny. And I know, I know Dave was on here and he was talking about uh, – Don Owens, how he used to pay in cash and he would make all these faces to get Don to give you more money. <laughs> but, right? But he had told me, he says, Don pays good. Don pays good. So the first week I go in there and he pays me and I, you know, I just, okay, thank you. And I, I walk out and he's coming to get paid and he goes, to get paid? I said, yeah, don't you say he was a good payoff man? This is about average. He goes, no, follow me. I'm going to show you how it's done. So he goes in there and he does his whole facing and all kinds of shit. And he goes, that's how you do it. So the following Saturday, I come in and there's Don and he's putting out the money and I'm like, you know, making all kinds of faces and he keeps throwing. He's going, son of a bitch, you're just as bad as your partner. What the hell here? Boom, he throws a hundred down there. I go, thank you, Don. I appreciate it. You're a good man. <laughs> I walked out and I see Dave coming. He goes, how'd that go? And I go, 
perfect, bro. Thanks for the insight. <laughs> but yeah, you know, or, or you would get the gig and get it busted the hard way all week long because you got an extra 25. So you gig hard on Saturday and, you, you know, you pick up another hundred and a quarter <laughs> of the week. Tough way to make a living, but that's what the boys did. <laughs> so he paid he paid extra for juice too, then, right? Yeah, twenty five. Yeah, twenty five. But twenty five, yeah. you you gig one night, then you bust yourself over the next few nights, and you get twenty five <laughs> every night. <laughs> every oh, night, perfect. Yeah, hell, <laughs> hell, John, the way way you and Chai, uh, uh, Eddie did it, man. You you've been good for a month. Man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. it, would, it would flow. Just tap it. Here we go. Boom, boom. For sure. So did did Elton <laughs> never figure out that you guys were working? No, never figured never. it out. Elton, uh, Elton had you know all the time, and I, I, <laughs> I'd be in there, and you know you got paid cash every night in that territory. So he would hate it. Well, he wouldn't hate it, but he would use the excuse that he hated when they would have the kids free. And you know we're in Eugene, and the house is packed. And I walk into the office and he's still counting out money and I'm just standing behind him. And he goes, oh, Jesus Christ, what are you doing? You don't trust me? I said, no, I'm just, just waiting for my pay. Oh, okay. Uh, I said, can I ask you a question? And he goes, yeah. And I go, what's the driving age here in Oregon? You know, I'm from Florida. I just want to see if, you know, comparisons are the same. He goes, well, you know, it's 16. Why are you asking? And I said, well, because the parking lot is full of cars. And you said there's a ton of kids. So there must be either a ton of kids that are driving without a license or somebody's lying to you, you know, that they're kids. And he goes, hey, what are you, a smart ass? There's a lot of roads leading out of Oregon. If you think the grass is greener, there's the door. I said, no, no, I just want to make sure, Elton. I just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah, I'd always I'd get him riled up and get him moving because he was easy to – to get riled, he wouldn't give a shit what his brother did with TV in Oregon. He was just, you know, and I would say to Dan, I said, hey, he's not following the program. I know. Just ask him why he's not following. So one night I had to ask him, hey, I'm not, you know, your, your brother, I don't give a fuck what my brother's doing up there. This is my territory, my town. I do what I want. Okay, just check him. I just check him. And I, Dave goes, what do you say? I go, well, you told me what he was going to say. You don't give a shit what Don's doing in Portland. This is his town. I said, yeah, you know, what are you going to do? You know, just keep brooding along. It was a short man crew. There was maybe 10 guys. And the referee, if he was a new guy, would have to work the first two matches as a babyface ref if you were a babyface. And then, you know, the rest of the thing was, you know, tag title, heavyweight title, and a, and a TV title. So it was, it was a pretty tight territory there wasn't a lot of guys so that was, was that was that was one of the best territories i think uh in the country because because of don and elton Owens and how oh, they yeah. ran, it, ran it so tight and and you know and, and the talent that they produced out of there the pipe oh, yeah. and, and all those guys coming down from canada wow what, what a crew they would have in it yeah yeah we had the you know you had you know dynamite kid buddy rose billy right. jack um, Snooka, Kurt Henning, you know, he would do the Jones show with Vern because he was tight with Vern and, you know, he had the big extravaganza. And, you know, you'd get to see Bach Winkle and, you know, all the other guys that were in Vern's territory at the time. Scott Norton, you know, he sent them to to Don. You know, I had to work with Norton, which was, oof, you know. Right. <laughs> how, 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 how was that program? I mean, well, you know, he was greener than Al shit and heavy handed as hell. He'd make, you know, anybody look light. And I remember one night because uh, the Portland Sports Arena wasn't and uh, an old bowling alley that they had converted. So I I called him. I said, you know, reverse. Give me a bear hug. Well, I don't know where he heard or what he heard. But as I jumped <laughs> in the air, he back dropped me. So I'm in the air and my feet hit the top of the rafter thing, you know, boom. And I come down, bam. And I get up and I just start swinging like a wild man at him. And I said, I said, bear hug, you deaf bastard. <laughs> and I shot him to the ropes and he grabs, he goes, sorry, buddy. I thought you said backdrop. I said, how the hell do you get backdrop out of bear hug? But yeah, I had to work a lot with Scott when he was, you know, coming out. And then Don would bring in for the shows John Nord. So it'd be Nord and, and Scott Norton in, in a tag match. So you knew you were in for a wild <laughs> ride. 
Hey, sure. Jerry, what was it with, uh, that, that David Sierra told us about uh, the guy who married uh, the sister, sister of the wrestler and he came, showed up on live TV as a shoot? Oh, uh, yeah, that was uh, uh, Matt Bourne. Matt, Matt Bourne. Bourne and, and who was it? Who was the wrestler? Uh, Buddy Rhodes. That's Buddy Rhodes. Right. Play, play more. And Buddy ended up yeah. marrying his sister and not Matt Bourne didn't know about it and showed up on live television for a fight. <laughs> yeah, literally, yes. You know, Matt, uh, you know, Tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> tough, yeah. Tough guy. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was like, you know, and, and, and Buddy was just, you know, a worker. <laughs> 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 big difference, Buddy. A big difference for sure. No doubt. Yeah. There was a lot of crazy things that would, you know, that would happen. I, I remember Roddy was helping Don out on my second run through there. And uh, I was a baby face, you know, for the longest time. And he walked in. I just ordered like, 1500 black and white, eight by tens to sell, right? And he walks in and Roddy goes, Listen, we're gonna change you and Curtis to a heel tag team <laughs> in the second in the second fall, because it was always two out of three falls, right? And you take a break in between falls. So I go, Really? <laughs> he goes, Yeah, 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 yeah. So we change and I go to the back and I got them all stacked there in the boxes. I had them mailed <laughs> to the arena. And Brady goes, what are you going to do with all those pictures? I said, ah. I said uh, Steve Dahl, come here, man. He was out in the territory at the time. He was one of the other baby faces. I said, listen, I want you to take the picture. I want you to take the Sharpie, and I want you to put the boycott sign on it. But leave the picture with Don Koss. Okay. So he walks out because he had the promo before me in the crow's nest. He walks out, he does it, and leaves it. I walk out with Curtis, and I look at him. What's in your hand, Koss? And he goes, uh, 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 and I grab it. I go, did you do this? Did you boycott me? Is that what it is? Is that what you're telling these people? I don't want to see another one of these pictures in any of the arenas I go to because this is what's going to happen. And I ripped it up and I left. So Sandy Barr was in charge of the pictures and he comes back in and he goes, hey, man, you got any more of those pictures? And I said, I got 1,500 of these. <laughs> <laughs> he said, good, because they're selling like hotcakes. <laughs> so we went out there and I was going to the ring and I was tearing them up and they would go buy them. I tear them up, they go buy them. So when we got to the back, I went over to Steve. I go, here you go, Steve. Here's a cut of what I made. He goes, for what? I go, because you got that over, and we're going to get rid of all these pictures on this week's loop, and I'm going to give you your cut, man. So uh, thanks for doing what you did. But Roddy comes back afterwards, and I, he looks at me and goes, ah, I was pretty slick. Quit thinking, kid. I said, yeah, you could have gave me a heads up. And Roddy says, well, you know, sometimes things turn out better when nobody knows but me. And it worked out pretty good. For me and for you, because you sold a lot of pictures, right, kid? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's the ticket. Yeah, but I had run into Roddy when, you know, when I met you in, in WWF, he put me on um, his pit when they had uh, Bobby Orton as Ace's bodyguard. Yeah. And he picked me because he liked my ring jacket because I was <laughs> the I was the enhancement guy that came with different boots, different tights, different jackets all the time. So he picked me and he said, listen, I want you to just, you know, when I give you the office under the table, say something sarcastic, but not disrespectful. And we'll go from there. I said, okay. So I went out there and he gives me the, the office. And I said, well, Mr. Piper, with all due respect, I personally don't need a bodyguard, but a guy who wears a skirt just might. And that was it. He stood up. It's a kill. And I went to go zip my jacket off and then, Bobby hits me from behind and da 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 da. You know, it was it was great. And uh, Roddy paid for all the beers for the Miami boys that night. So I got wow. I had to thank so, him for that. So one. That, that, that was the first time an ace came in and protected their hot rod. Was that not with you? That's all. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, yeah, it was the Piper's pit. Yeah. And uh, he, you know, he went around the backside and and, and nailed me because he says, "You know who this is?" I go, "Yeah, it's, it's your bodyguard." And that's when I went in to tell him what I told him. So. You know, so I developed that kind of relationship with with Roddy, you know, and obviously working in Portland also. But, yeah, it was uh, it was interesting things that went on in that Portland territory that, you know, it was raining all the time. You know, it rained like nine <laughs> months out of the year. So you improved on your drinking habit. You know, some of the <laughs> some of those towns, you know, 100 mile trip and you drink on the way down, drink on the way home. <laughs> it just you just had to because, you know, no wonder that they call them the, you know, the Oregon Ducks and the Oregon State Beavers because you got to be wet-seeded <laughs> to, to, to survive out there for nine months in the rain. 
I never thought about I never thought about that. Her mascots are all water animals. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean it's just crazy. But yeah, that's that's the way it was. It was a it was a great territory. And um from there I uh uh we got our Don told us we had to be start looking for a place to go because we had been out there, me and Dave, for a while. And um, you know, we made the call. We were going to to Charlotte. And um, you know, we walked in and we told Don, hey, you know, giving you a two week notice. He goes, Well, why the hell did you do that for? Well, you just told us last week we need to find a place for us <laughs> to go. And he said, But I'm talking like, you know, four or five months down down the road, not right now. <laughs> Sorry, you know, he said, but you'll always have a place. You just give me a call. I said, all right, Don, I appreciate it. So, yeah, we went we went to Charlotte, but that's when um, everything was, was starting to explode and, and Jim Crockett was was going on that madcap of, of buying everything, you know, under the sun. So we were doing a lot of traveling in the, in the Charlotte territory, which was good. I mean, I did my time there and got to work with some of the best talent in the business, so. You know, I was I was grateful for that opportunity. Dusty gave me a break. You know, I got now, uh, tell tell us tell us a little bit about that break. What 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 was the deal on the Dusty? Oh, uh, you know, they they brought us in as the Cuban connection. You know, me and Dave, because that's what we had done. You know, in the past. And when I when I got there, you know, we were working, but you know, they had us as baby faces. And you know, we went into Pittsburgh. And, you know, we couldn't get over with those people as a baby face, even if we tried, you know, flag waving, camo, you know, the whole bit. So, uh, you know, we were going to sit down and, and, and talk to, to to the dream, you know, about, you know, making us a heel or doing something different. And I remember we were at TBS and um, he come in, Gene Ligon uh, was uh, refereeing at the time and he come in and he wanted to talk to Dave. Um, by himself and then he wanted to talk to me but David already had made up his mind that he was going to go back to Portland because he could see that nothing was going to develop here so Dusty came and I thought I said well that means I'm done too you know I mean tag team's done then, you know we're out of here and he said uh baby in the famous words of the tunnel <laughs> when he was talking to Elvis I like what I see and I'm going to give you a push baby a big push baby you're going to be a baby face and you're going to do good for me, baby. I said, okay. And he said, but I need you to do me a favor. I said, what's that? He says, I need you to sign autographs, kiss babies, hug grandma and grandpa and everybody. And I said, okay. And he said, but the most important thing is you have to bring the ladies, if you know what I mean, baby. Because you're young and you're good looking and you know what to do if you know what I'm saying, baby. Because, you know, when we good looking like me and you, then we know how to draw the lady. And I said, oh, okay, I got you. And he goes, and you know the ladies that always hang around the locker room, those ladies too count. I said, yeah, I got you, Dream, I got you. And you know, he gave me that push. And it surprised me because we went into Louisville to do the worldwide show and I walk in and I'm on five of the six segments with Flair. I didn't know that. So here I am, you know, mentally going, okay, I got to, you know, do five, six out of the six segments in the hour. But Kevin Sullivan being Kevin, when Flair walks in, he goes, hey, Nate, the kid says you can't blow him up. <laughs> and Flair looked up and goes, really, did you say that? I said, no, Rick, I didn't I didn't even mention anything like that. And Kevin goes, quit lying. Say it now, tough guy. <laughs> you were talking all that shit before. Say it now. Tell him you're going to blow him up so bad you're going to step on his tongue, run around and put a sandwich on his back and starve him to death. I just looked at Kevin because Kevin was living with me in Charlotte and I just go, Kev, no. <laughs> no. No, no, please don't. <laughs> no, no. So, you know, we went out there and, you know, he did everything and he was happy with it, and I was happy with it because you know he called everything, and I did everything he asked me to. Well, what did you blow him up? I didn't blow him up. <laughs> he was going, but I didn't blow him up, right? <laughs> and then he he said to me, he says, "Hey, question." I said, "Sure." He says, "Did you really say that?" I said, "No, I didn't say it." And he goes, "Hmm." I said, "But I will tell you this: even if you did blow me up." I would never let you know it. I would have sucked it up and kept going. 
And he said, okay, uh, I'll see you later. And that's when, you know, the bar and the kamikazes and the money to play three songs and 100 kamikazes at closing time. And oh my Lord, it was, it was that type. <laughs> it was uh, one of those territories. And then, you know, I was married to different people, you know, in different times because I was there for so long. And uh, uh, John, you had mentioned uh, Black Bart. Yeah, you know, and uh, and every time I'd see him on that schedule, you know, on the booking sheet, it was like, okay, I got a great week because I got Bart. And, you know, he said the same thing when I talked to him a couple weeks ago. He uh, he said that he said, I saw when I saw you that gummit on the paper, I knew it was gonna be a night off. So that gummit, you know. <laughs> and uh, I always uh, I always kid him about it because I said, you know. You, you can hit me there, Bart. And he said, no, no, we're working, kid. No, that hitting stuff's for everything. We're working, we're working. But don't get stupid, because I will hit you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. But Bart was a, was a good guy. I was married to him for a while. Oh, we did, uh, you know, different runs at different times. We had that uh, little hey, bit of know, run with. I'm sorry, I mean, cut you off. You know, Bart, it sounds like, it feels, it sounds like he's beat the cancer. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he had stage four cancer, and they gave yes, him a very yes. small chance of living. And yes. it sounds like he's actually beaten it. Not not for sure yet, but he's only got a couple more chemo uh, things left. And the doctors for him. Did, John, are, are they still? Are you guys still raising raising funds for him? And if so, can you can you kind of? Yeah, it's still the same. Uh, uh, GoFundMe page of Black Bart. It is Google Black Bart and GoFundMe, and you can donate directly to him. And all, every bit of it goes to you know his chemo and all that stuff. He has to pay about six hundred bucks every time he goes in for chemo, even though he has insurance. So, and he can't work because he's so sick from the chemo. But he's feeling better. He's still taking the Good. chemo. He's still sick, but it sounds like he's actually uh, beat it. Wow, that's, that's great. Nice. That's great to hear. I'll have to give him a call to see how he's doing because. Uh, you know, uh, he was he was thankful that I called him just to you know just to stay. Oh, he, he loves it. He, when, when we, yeah. he was one of my first tag partners in Texas, and when he'd hear that cowbell coming walking in the dressing, he'd hear that cowbell as I come in the dressing room. He goes, he'd have that those you know he puts up his glass. Yeah. And he goes, I hate the sound of that cowbell because I know that long tall drink of shit's coming with it. <laughs> Talk about me. <laughs> he said that every single night. <laughs> We were we were in Puerto Rico, and um, yeah, the boys used to stay at a place called the Dahlia Dahlia Quince. Oh yeah, Quince. yeah, I mean, I know. that was that <laughs> had to be improved to be a dump. <laughs> that was the worst one hundred percent on the yeah, planet. I, yes, I've seen uh, uh, roaches pull a knife on rats and take your keys in that place. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is rough. So he's in the room, and he's uh. Uh, sharing a room with um, Muhammad Hussein, right? And they're sitting there, and Bart's in his cowboy boots. He's got his hat on. He's got his dip, and he's whittling. He's in his boxers. <laughs> and uh, I come over, and I said, Bart, what are you doing? He's I'm just whittling over here, just killing time, you know, my time on the island. I said, okay. And then, you know, Hussein starts to jaw in on him. He's busting his balls, you know, for about two weeks straight. And he looked over, and he said, now, Louis, I'm going to tell you, you keep doing that, and I'm going to throw this knife at you. Man, Louis, ah, you ain't doing shit. And he says, I'll see you later. And he goes to walk out the door. And Bart goes, Louis. And Louis turns around, and Bart goes, <laughs> throws the knife. Louis out the door, bam, it sticks in there. And I go, Bart, what if you would have hit him? Ah, just a little flesh wound. He'd be all right. <laughs> I failed. You're killing me, Bart. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me give you your knife back. Stick the whittler, buddy. <laughs> oh yeah, he was uh, he was too much. And then we took all his money, Cuban, myself, and the barbarian. We did the uh, when worlds collide, the three man battle ring thing in, in WCW, and we had a uh, early flight. All of us flying out, so we decided to play um, poker cards. So everybody's in, everybody's in, and we're taking all of Bart's money. All of Bart's money. He wasn't. And, uh, he wasn't bitching, was he? <laughs> he was hooping and hollering. So I, I, I turn around, and I know he's a big John Wayne fan, right? Yeah, so we're huge. There. <laughs> we're playing, and I go to Dave. Yeah, I go, Dave, watch this. I go, yeah, we're taking all your money, Bart. The same way Gene Autry kicked John Wayne's ass. He's done, dick. He had two silver dollars, <laughs> and his. And his wallet that he had saved, you know, 
and we had them put them out there and sure as shit we took the silver dollars <laughs> and, and, and he turned around and i said bonnie's gonna be upset ain't she now and i go hey don't feel bad. John Wayne felt the same way when Gene Archer kicked his ass the second time. <laughs> oh, he was hot, boy. I'd always get him with that one for sure. But yeah, Bart's good people, man. I like Bart. Bart used to tell Dick Murdoch, Diggy, I love you, but I'm going to find a patch of green grass and we're going to fight. <laughs> 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 they, ne they never fought, but Bart said yeah. that every single day. Dick Dick would just poke and poke and poke and poke and poke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Dickie was good for poking. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Hell, there, hell, 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 there's no green grass out in Texas there, Ricky. <laughs> no, there's just dirt. <laughs> I know there's just dirt. A lot of dirt, a lot of dirt. Speaking of Dickie Murdoch, I got a Dickie Murdoch story for you. In Japan, uh, we're there, and he goes, come on, Rickles, we're going to go out and drink. I said, all right, because I got a sponsor. I said, all right. So I go out with him and we're out to like six in the morning, you know. I get back to the hotel, the bus is leaving at eight, you know, and I I'm working, you know, and in Japan, you work. <laughs> you know, you gotta work hard. So the next night, I'm still hung over. He says, I'll meet you tonight. We're going out again. I got another sponsor. Oh, so I go to my room and I hear him knocking on the door. And I didn't answer the door. Uh -uh. So then Dickie walks away. And about 10 minutes later, I hear somebody opening the door. He convinced the bell guy downstairs to come up, open up my room. And he goes, see, I knew you were here, Rickles. Come on, come on, come on. And I'm back <laughs> out again, right? And I'm going, holy shit, you know. Yeah. My liver's starting to quiver with you, Dickie. Yeah. So third night, he goes, I got another sponsor. And so, oh. I go up to my room and I could hear him coming down the hallway. So I hid in the closet, uh -huh. right? <laughs> closet, you know, in Japan, you're like this. And he goes down, he gets that bellhop and he opens up and he goes, well, some bitch, I guess he's, he's not in his room. He must've went out without me. Next day on the bus, he says to me, where you been? He says, well, Dickie, you know, I, I, I found me a sponsor. So I had to go out with them because, you know, sponsors are reporting here in Japan. He said, hmm. Okay, well, we got tonight. We got that was the longest three week tour of my life, hanging with Murdoch, <laughs> drinking every night. Oh my God, he'd kill you. I used to ride with Murdoch when we were he was we were in Texas. We tagged up together, and a Skander Akbar put us together. And I'd have to hand him Coors Lights going down the road. But if I oh, didn't, yeah. I didn't know what he was doing. He'd throw every other one out the window, and I didn't realize if I didn't hand the mouth of the beer toward him, he would just throw it out the window. <laughs> I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It's just me and him in the truck. There's nobody else. And he's, and he's ribbing me. I'm like, yeah. He wouldn't let me uh, talk. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Yeah. yeah that's, I didn't that's, care. That's, I was with Dick Murdoch. I didn't care. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. For sure. For sure. So after the, the – was that when you went down to Puerto Rico? Was after the – Yes, yes. Uh, after the, the Charlotte run for, you know, quite a while. Oh, and by the way, let me ask you a question. Dave Sierra told us the, the best story about how he swam uh, 90 miles in shark-infested waters when he was three years old to get here from Cuba. I was wondering <laughs> – I was wondering if you had any similar <laughs> stories. Did he swear on a stack of wrestlers? True story. Yeah, yeah, oh, he did. yeah, true, true, true story. <laughs> yeah, it was right after the Scott. It was right after the Scott Casey UFO story. Yeah, <laughs> he barely swam in a pool, let alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, what you're saying that story not true? He didn't have to swim those ninety miles. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> with, with with his baby brother on his back. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that makes it good, right? <laughs> With his eyes open underwater, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh Lord! So man. you, so you swam down to Puerto Rico from uh, from uh, from uh, North Carolina. Yes, North yes. Uh, Luke Williams was the one that was instrumental in in, in booking me into uh, into Puerto Rico when I first got there. So you know, I got there, and that was oof. That was a whole. Those those guys, those guys were so over down there, either at the oh, heel yeah. or baby face, man. They were just so entertaining. Yeah. It was, but it was a whole different realm of of everything was straight kayfabe shoot. Everything you did was that way. And, and then this is this is pre uh, Bruiser too, I assume. Yeah, yeah, and then you know the Bruiser incident happened, and 
and everything else in business dropped off. But what it was is that everything was was always portrayed as so legit, you know, in, in the kayfabe aspect of it. Right. I came in to do TV. I didn't know they had four shows on a Wednesday. <laughs> I had to work every show. And the, my finish was a splash. So, you know, here it is. And I'm, I'm doing all the four shows for the island. And then the one that used to go into Trinidad was another one. So, you know, you had 20, 30 matches lined up to do all this on a, on a Wednesday. But Thursday, we're going to a, usually it was a smaller town, you know, spot show type of town. And I show up early because that's how I was taught, you know, get in there. And I'm, I see this little kid and he's putting up a stand. He's got the boxes and he puts plywood down and he opens up his bag and he's pulling out rocks, bags of rocks. And I walked up to him and I said, what are those for? He goes, oh, I sell them. I go, you sell those? He goes, yeah, yeah. He says, are you a good guy or a bad guy? <laughs> and I go, well, I'm a good guy. He goes, well, you don't have to worry about it. If they won't hit you, they'll hit the bad guy. <laughs> he was selling them for three bucks for a bag of rocks. <laughs> and he had picked them up. He had collected them. And I'm saying, this is unreal. I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump right in there. You, you, what you're telling me is true. I, I, we're working with uh, Dorian Terry Funk. Mm -hmm. So uh, so Jack and I, of course, we go to the ring first. And here comes the Funk out here. And Jack's telling me, watch Terry tonight. He's going to do something stupid. <laughs> I know he's watched Terry. It's at yeah. Clemente, you know, what, 15, 16,000 people. Yeah. Just dream, dreaming drunk. So we're in the ring. We're watching Terry. Terry's coming out. He's clearing a path, of course. So you you know how they go. He goes over by the batter's box or the warm-up box. He grabs a handful of, 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 of gravel. They got gravel there, you know, by the batter box. Terry yeah. comes out and Jackson watch him. And all of a sudden Terry goes out and he throws. He throws <laughs> and because we see him, so we jump, so it hits the first row of ringside. Every one of those people sat ringside. Opens their jacket, get their rock, and start throwing them back. Now yeah. it's like a now it's like a little rock fight going back and forth between the fans and Terry Funk, man. It's wild. Yeah, it was it was that. Uh, you know, I, I always wondered where all those rocks come from. All of a sudden, you know, but the yeah, guy that was little kid was an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was selling rocks, a different kind of rock. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, you know it was that type of uh, territory. You know, I remember we were in a town, it's called Louisa, and it's, you know, the, the sense that from the African slaves, it's mostly, you know, the black Puerto Ricans that, that live in Louisa. And we had Bronco from the Dominican Republic, and he's standing there and he says, yeah, that town where the only thing you can see is the whites of their eyes, unless they smile, then you get a high beam from their teeth, right? And he's, you know, he's a black Dominican. You know, so they got out and he goes, but I'm not black, I'm Indian, is what he said. So we go to the town and sure as shit, they set his car on fire. Wow. <laughs> Fortunate, you know, and it was like, well, I guess he got some serious heat for sure. But yeah, that was that was the deal. You know, the fans were just that, you know, that type of diehard fan. Now, they've mellowed out, you know, because the business has changed, but Back in the 80s. That, 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 that's what's so great about the about the sheep herders or the Kiwis down there. I mean, they bring yeah. them in as, as sheep herders and they'd be hills or vice versa. The Kiwis, they'd be baby faces. And man, they just, because they entertain those folks down there, they just love them to death. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, they all that bob wire and the fire and all, all kinds of gimmick matches down there. And you know it, it was it was you, 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 were you were you booking at that time or was that later when? Oh uh, no, the second time I went through, I, I started the book um, only because you know I was I was speaking out loud in the dressing room to one, uh, to the Batten twins about you know people should watch the matches like I was taught so you don't do the same thing you know and you make sure that the finishes are different and everything else you could have done this this and this and this that and that. And by the fourth match, Carlos walks over. He goes, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, sure. He goes, uh, I hear your comments. And I'm going, oh, shit. Put my foot in my mouth now, right? He goes, come with me. And he's taking me into the to the bathroom of the showers. Oh. Right? So I said, no, you first. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead, buddy. You first, right? And he looked at me and he knew what I was thinking, right, in, in, in the mind. And he goes, I hear you, you know, I said, well, you know, Carlos, just an observation, you know, if I'm out of turn, I'm out of turn, but I wasn't trying to be disrespectful to anybody. I just think that we could do something better to, 
not be so monotonous and do the same shit every night. He goes, would you like to take the book? Uh -uh. I said, take the book um, on one condition. He goes, what's that? I go, I only deal with you. I don't need 17 cooks in the kitchen trying to tell me what I should do, what I shouldn't do. Everything that I come up with, I'll run by you. You give me the nay, you give me the yay, and that's what we'll do it, and that's how we'll go. Absolutely. So, boom, that's what had happened there. But the funny part of that story that I had said in the locker room years later was that when I was in San Antonio, Hercules Ayala came out because they had a working relationship out there with him. And he saw the tag team that we were using, me and Tony, and he said, you guys, I think we'll get over big time in Puerto Rico. I said, well, I don't know nobody in the office. I don't have any, you know. He says, I got the tape. He says, here's the address. Send them the VTR, the tape, and, you know, you'll be good. So what they did is they sent me back the tape with a note because I didn't have all those years in the business. The note said, we don't take anybody that doesn't have more than five years in the business. So they sent me back my tape. So I'm sitting there with Carlos and everybody sitting there. I go, Carlos, ain't got some shit? And he goes, what do you mean? I go, first, I saw you as a kid working against Johnny Rods when you were a kid in the garden. Second, I sent you a tape. You tell me you don't want nobody that doesn't have five years or more, maybe not you, but whoever was booking at the time. I said, and then I've booked your territory on three separate occasions and made your money. Ain't that some shit? <laughs> and he just looked at me like, damn, <laughs> you, you got me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But he said, I made the first move. I said, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. But, you know, I still, uh, you know, go down there. Thanks to you, Jay, teaching me the gorilla position. Um, I do their pay-per-views that they're doing now. And I run the times and get everybody on board. And I've gotten That's them awesome. off the air on three of them, uh, getting ready to do another one in January going down there uh, to do it. So, yeah, they're happy with it. I tell them exactly when we're going off the air, and that's when we're going off the air. So, hey, Ricky, you know, so, every, yeah, territory, every territory I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Every territory is different. You know, I mean, it's famously, you know, Memphis was different from Texas, from, yeah. different from you know, the Carolinas, every, you know, every territory different from Florida, different from Vern. Yeah. When you're booking Puerto Rico, how is it different – from the other territories you had worked in, as far as your mindset from San Antonio to Charlotte to Japan to different places you had been? What I did is, uh, since it was a blood and guts type of territory, I remember all the major angles that were done in Florida and were done in Mid South and ones where we used stretchers because that was the thing out there in the Northwest, the coal miners' glove and the Indian strat matches. So we would do, you know, the flag matches and all that other stuff. So I would take those thought processes, those angles from back then and kind of tweak them a little bit, depending on who they were for. Cause you know, some talent could pull off any angle and some talents can't and you had to walk them through. But for the most part, it was for me, it's swerving the marks it gives me the greatest satisfaction because everybody nowadays is the armchair booker and they all figure everything out and they think they know everything. So when you cross them and you swerve them, then you got them committed into watching and watching and the ratings would go up and everything else. So it was a, it was a challenge because, you know, you, there was number one with all the foreigners coming in, you'd have the language barrier. Number one, locker rooms were never together. They were always separate. So you had to have everything on a tape recorder that I would record to send over to the, you know, to the foreign guy so they could hear it and they would know what, what the finish was. But I used Japanese finishes, a lot of false finishes, long ones, you know, and the referees would be going, can you just make it a little shorter? I said, no, we, 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 we got to keep them going, you know, got to keep them going. So they you play with their emotions. So yeah, it was, it was different, but it was still, you know, the, the, the basics, you know, the baby face chasing the heel for the title and, you know, the, the all the old school angles, the, the juice and the dresses and the surprises and the powder and the nuts and the chains, you know, <laughs> everything involved, you know, from old school. You know, it's amazing. When WWE did a pay-per-view down there, I think two or three years ago, I can't remember, maybe right before COVID, I can't. I think it was, and people talk about how great the crowd was. And I, and I was like, that's Puerto Rico. <laughs> it's just, yeah, 
They've always they're that's some of the most passionate fans in the world. It's incredible. Yeah, they, they had done one a long time. They just recently did one a um, couple of months ago, and they went in there. Um, that's what brought Carly back because he he was down there working for his yeah. dad, and he got it there. But they didn't know Bronson's name, you know, and he was just starting to get his push right. And if you listen to the fans, you know, they always, uh, Spanish people always got nicknames for people. That's how they, they, they associated with. So they would be chanting El Gordito, which is the chubby one. So that's who they were saying when he was splashing and they were in unison. That's the reason, that's the reason, that's the reason they called JBL that name. That's right. That's how I got over the chubby one. <laughs> Son of a bitch. That's what that name means. I thought there I was you go, <laughs> Uh, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, that's Crazy when uh, sure. and Savio came out. Just and the place went absolutely ballistic when Savio came out. It was it was pretty. Yeah, insane. Savio and, and 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 Carly all went down there, and they, you know, they, it's, they're very outside of the the Mexicans who are very patriotic too. They're the there's the things, and that's what got us. That's what got us a lot of heat in Mexico when we went in there. Um, Dave and myself, and Miguelito Perez. So we were called Boricuas before WWF did it. But it was funny because it was two Cuban guys and a Puerto Rican guy. But we all did the the, the Puerto Rican gimmick. And we did everything that was never done in, in, in Mexico, like, you know, laying flags on top of people. And, oh, my God, we had so much heat. They wanted to kill us. You know, it was a fight just getting back to the dressing room. And, you know, they got those big coins and they, they swing them, you know, and they, they're just passionate, you know. It was it was, it was definitely a, a, a different mindset that we had to go and, you know, we brought a in. Different, a different mindset between the Mexican people and the Puerto Rican people? Oh, and, yeah, and, I, I, absolutely. What, 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 what kind of mindset was it then? Uh, they were used to um, all the obviously the high flying, the yeah, the lucha, the lucha, and and what we did is we did all the strong, you know, strong stuff, you know, the the, the power bombs with clotheslines off the top, you know, just the, the heavy hitting, um, leaving them bloody, putting flags over, them. and we started doing promos, and I would be kind of like the lead speaker. And what got us a whole bunch of heat was I said, you know, we have that special section for all the ladies so they can see what real men look like because Mexican men are just beer drinking, fat tequila, squealing cowboy wannabes. And I'd say that and I would get heat with the guys. And I said, and the ladies are dying for real men. But most importantly, you know why? They want to get out of this stinking hellhole because I have the advantage. Not because I'm good looking, not because I'm a great wrestler. And I pulled out my passport. And I said, because I'm born with a blue passport. I don't have to swim across no river. I don't have to tunnel under any towns. They just get on a plane and we fly, baby. Oh my God. The cameraman goes, You guys are signing your death warrant because they're gonna come, <laughs> they're gonna come kill you guys. And yeah, I'd have women hitting me with their high heels, all kinds of shit. Yeah. It was the, it was definitely the mindset was different. They're very patriotic. And when we laid the flag on top of uh Silver King and Tejano, the commission, because they got a legitimate commission, says you can't do that with the flag. I said, it's not the Mexican flag. It's the Puerto Rican flag. And I'm not out in Puerto Rico, and I didn't deface the flag in Puerto Rico. I didn't step on it or nothing. So they they had, they had to, they asked us to tone it down because we were just getting way, way, way too big. And they were, they were pushing us strong, too. I'd come out with a poster board that said Mexico zero, Puerto Rico one. Puerto Rico too, Mexico. We got it up to like eight or nine until uh, Julio Cesar Chavez beat Macho Camacho. And then they gave us a bunch of shit about that. And I said, he got that because he ate some bad tacos. And he told me that if he would have been at home and training in his own land, he wouldn't have got sick and he would have beat Julio Cesar Chavez. So, you know, talking shit. <laughs> it's amazing how that stuff works so well. When I was wrestling Eddie, Eddie called me one time. I was doing a promo. And he goes, hey, S.A., S.A., stop, stop, stop. I got, I got something for you. I said, what's that? He goes, tell them my ancestors come over here in a boat, not an inner tube. <laughs> I said, Eddie, you're going to get me killed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, goes, yeah. No, no, it's good. I said, it's good. I said, no, it's good because I'm saying it, Eddie, not you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I remember while Eddie was, uh, we were in a sixth man in, in Puebla, and Eddie was in my corner, and I just got back from Japan, and I went and ate some more Japanese food. 
but I ate the salad that was washed with the water and I didn't realize that. So now I got a fever about 102, I'm cramping and everything. Eddie walks up and he goes, hey, I say, does it feel like somebody's sticking a knife in your gut? I said, yeah, it does, Eddie. No, no, I mean like really, really sticking it in deep. I said, yeah, I see. and they're twisting it? I said, yeah, Eddie, they're twisting it. My stomach hurts and I got a fever. He goes, welcome to Mexico. That's Montezuma's revenge essay. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> Thank you, because I feel like shit. He goes, you know the little black pills they have in Japan that you take for when your stomach's upset? I go, yeah. He goes, we don't got them here. <laughs> oh, thanks, Eddie. He said, we got white ones. They're called Bactrin. I'll get you some when we leave. Oh, Eddie was too much, man. Love him to death. I mean, you know, he's just a great guy. My daughters, you know, when they were little, had pictures with Eddie and the whole Guerrero family. You know, we all go way back. But, you know, he was, he was, he was a character. I loved Eddie. He was, and all his brothers were. We just had Hector on the show. I I got to work with Hector <laughs> you know, years ago, but I, I loved Hector. Yeah. Chavo was the same. His brother, you know, yeah, his, yeah his, Mondo. Was, Did you meet Mondo? I met him. Yeah, but I don't. I didn't know yeah. Mondo well, but I've met Mondo many times. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's he's a character too, <laughs> for sure, for sure. He, so, yeah, he, that was. We I'm were sorry, watching, that, yeah. we were watching a fight one time on television, or like a, a basketball game turned into a fight. I'm sitting there with Eddie. I said, Eddie, that looked like your Thanksgiving dinner. He goes, exactly like my Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> <laughs> with all my brothers. <laughs> yeah, it's all the brothers. They'd always <laughs> argue, but they loved it. You, well, you couldn't mess with one because you get them all. That's for sure. That is for sure. Yeah, we did the big angle with his with with their dad, Gory. Well, we laid him out and left him laying when um, uh, Chavo went to Japan. And it was like crazy, bro. They went nuts. They wanted to kill Madrill, myself, Tony, and uh, Black Gordon. They wanted to kill us. You were you remember when JBL gave uh, Mrs. Guerrero uh, uh, a heart attack out in El Paso, right? <laughs> heart attack? Yeah. yeah. How'd that yeah. happen? It oh, was man, I, John had to run for his life that night. Oh, yeah. It was Mother's Day weekend in El Paso, and Eddie and okay. I were up on the sta Staples Center, and Chavo uh, and Eddie came to me backstage. We got an idea. He said, we're going to honor Gory Guerrero, their father, in El Paso right. on Mother's Day weekend, and after the match, come out, leave Eddie laying, and Mom is going to fake a heart attack. Oh. And when she went down, Ricky – you could hear a pin drop in that arena in El Paso. It was the oh, I've yeah. never seen anything like it. And they had state troopers around the ring to protect me. Eddie's the Eddie's on the uh, mat and he goes, "SA, you better get the fuck out of here." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they had my car running. They get they, the state troopers are getting me back, and I got to get it on film, you know, because that that's the whole angle. So I'm sitting there yelling at the crowd. Troopers are going, John, you've got to get out of here. They're going to riot. They're about to, about to riot. <laughs> Finally, we yeah. got to the car. They take me all the way to the city limit of El Paso, the state troopers do, and tell me, don't come back in the city. <laughs> Literally, I had to drive to a Odessa to fly oh. to, to the next town because the, the police in El Paso told me to leave town. Well, yeah, God, yeah, that's I can imagine because it we was did a unbelievable. Yeah, a few years later, we we're in El Paso and they didn't book me there because they, they were worried about my safety. <laughs> oh, yeah, it could happen because I remember we did it with with Gore. They took him out in in uh, in the ambulance on the stretcher and everything. And I remember Al Madrill telling me as we were in the junction, we were walking back, and he says, "Watch the hands, watch the hands, watch the hands." And I'm thinking. Watch your hand, watch your hand. And you know, we're going through there quick, you know, fighting to get back in the locker room. And I said, Hey, Al, I said, Why are you telling me watch your hands? I got to see if somebody's going to swing at me. He goes, They're not going to swing, they're just going to cut you as you walk by. And that from that point on, it was just like all the time, watch your hands, watch your hands. And that happened to uh, a guy that uh, giant warrior who was in Mexico on the way back in the Toreo. I told him, watch your hands, watch your hands. And he said, what? And what? they slid him, boop. And he was in the back getting sewn up. But, yeah, it was nuts. You couldn't mess with a Guerrero in the El Paso or Texas or Houston <laughs> or L.A. <laughs> you know what? That was funny. You know what's funny, Ray, is for, for years I'd go through airports and you'd see a group of Hispanics and, and that you could hear them cussing me because of Eddie. <laughs> you could hear I, As soon as I walk by, my wife would go, what's that? I go, just ignore it. Just ignore it. <laughs> 
Well, then yeah. when, it, when when Eddie unfortunately passed away, I did I did the part of the eulogy at his funeral because uh, we, okay. were, we were very close. Right. And the, the people found out then that you know Eddie and I were really close friends. Well, now it's just the opposite. When I go through an airport and there's a group of Hispanics go, "Hey," uh, and they want to talk to me about Eddie. So now. now <laughs> That's that now, fan, right? <laughs> now I can go back to El Paso. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. good. <laughs> Definitely. Because when you have to get banned from a town, I've heard a ban from the building, but you were banned from the town. I was banned from the whole town. Here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey well, I'll tell you a quick story. It's funny. The next, the first, after that video aired, everything okay. changed. I mean, the heat changed, everything changed because people couldn't believe what I had done to the mother and all this stuff, you know. And, and the first night we're in San Bernardino, huge, you know, Latino population. Yeah. And the guy jumps in the ring as soon as the match starts. He's trying to get to me, you know, after that. Well, little Hebner is has turned into <laughs> Pat McAfee and punted this guy in the face. I mean, just he almost <laughs> kicked his head off. And Eddie is Eddie is so mad that the guy messed up our match that Eddie's going after the fan. And so I've tackled Eddie. I've double legged, but I'm holding him back. With Eddie, I'm the heel. They're not going to understand you beating up the fan coming after me. He goes, the guy screwed up our match. He screwed up our match. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Yes. Memories, my friend. Oh, they were so Please good. Yeah. So, so what happened to Puerto Rico? How, how did you end up? Is that when you ended up being an agent? And, and, and uh, well, I actually, I, I went back to um, WCW. Um, I went back in there because I uh, I was getting a, like I said, I was getting a, a good push from Dusty and everything, but then I got comfortable in my position and got lazy and I got fat. And Jim Crockett says the Latin sensation turned into a Latin burrito. And uh, Al Perez came into the territory from Dallas. You know, Al was ripped. And they have him there with Gary and everything, and I'm going, eh, eh, eh. And I said, well, I think it's time for me to go. Let me go. You know, I was talking to Kevin. Kevin says, you need to get yourself back in the shape that you were in before. And, you know, take a leave. You got somewhere to go. I said, yeah, you know, that's when I said I was going to Puerto Rico. And then I came back. And uh, Dusty pinned me up with Brian Pillman. He wanted another version of, you know, Rock and Roll Express, blonde hair guy, dark hair guy, yada, 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 yada. And we were working and they were pushing. And right before the Great American Bash, I was going to work the program with uh, Bill Irwin for the Bash for the 16 dates. Uh, he did the old bull whip, you know, beat me, lay me on the ground, the whole bit, you know. And Jim Barnett says, listen, when, when we come back from the, from the Bash, we're going to sit you down and sign you up to a three-year deal, guaranteed money. And I said, okay. You know, there was, was some hefty change. So we're doing the TVs, and I do the the macho man thing to jump off the top of to the floor with Al Green, God rest his soul. And I had done it a couple of times with him, house shows and, and, and around on TV. So we're going to the ring, and it's me and Brian. And that's when Brian says, listen, I call the spot. You know, I'm gonna, he's going to throw me in the corner. I'm going to kip up. I'm going to head scissor him out. I'm going to give you the tag. You come off the top. I'll come right behind you. I said, are you sure? And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows the spot. I said, okay. So here we go. Al takes the head scissor and goes out to the floor. I go to the top, but when I jump, Al steps forward instead of staying where he was at. So I landed stiff leg. So I blew out my ACL, my medial, my lateral, no meniscus, no cartilage, no nothing. It was just hanging. So I get up on the apron and Tommy Young says, you're legal. I go, no, I'm not. He goes, yeah, you are. You're hurt and you're probably in shock, but you're legal. So we finished the match, and I go back, and, um, you know, they had me out, and they said it was going to be a year and a half, but I did get back at, uh, you know, five and a half months. But by that time, they had already put Tom Zink into that place, and he ran to three years, signed another three-year rollover, and then had another two-year, and they were trying to beat him, in, you know, every night to get him to quit because they were paying him, you know, like 400 and something thousand a year. And uh, Zink says, if you can find a way to beat me in two, beat me in two. I'll be the highest state job boy you ever see, but I ain't walking out on my money. And he didn't. <laughs> he got paid all the money. You know, God rest his soul, too. But, you know, that was the situation that opened the doors for me to go to Japan 
and open the doors for me to go to Mexico and go for auto and go to South Africa with Justin Gabriel's dad and over to uh, India. You know, I, I went everywhere because I had to, you know, make a living, right? So that's that's how that all came about, me going overseas. And I used Puerto Rico as my home base, flying in and out till I got back and, you know, had an opportunity to become an agent in WCW. And uh, I went there and they gave me all the cruiser weights. So there I am back again with Eddie and Chavo Jr. and Hoovy and Ray Ray and all those guys. And um, all I did was make sure that the finish came across for what they were trying to establish. And I let them do their things. And, you know, I had worked with most of them in the past where their dads. So I had their respect. And, you know, it was the highest rated segment for the longest time. We would open the show with that, you know, crash and burn. And, um, you know, I was grateful for those guys you know, gave me a lot of experience. And then obviously Vince came in and bought it out and reunite with Jerry. And he teaches me the gorilla position. I kind of think he was trying to get away from it. And that's why he <laughs> <to> me. <laughs> you you Jerry was but, trying to uh, quit the gorilla position for years. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a good thing that I learned it. You know, I learned a lot there. And, you know, when you're under the gun and you're under that pressure, you know, you got to perform. So, you know, I enjoyed it. And it's a learning lesson. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to Jerry for a lot of things, except for cutting weight. You know, I'll never let him down for that one. But other than that, <laughs> it's always a good deal, you know. And every time we have those legends lunches in Tampa, we always save a seat for Gerald. Um, we missed them this time because even Haku was asking me, brother, brother, Jerry coming today? I said, ah, I don't know. I said, Dave, did you talk to him? He says, I don't think he's coming, but we always have a seat for him. That's for sure. So he knows that. So we'll just and, 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 and a bucket of ice cold beer. Oh yeah, the the big man this time around. Oh my lord, there must have been I, I, short, easy sixteen that he had bought, and it was just drinking and drinking. It was uh, him, Dave, myself, uh, Barbara Goodish, Darla. And a friend of dollars, we're all sitting there drinking beer. You know, that thing's over, you know, like 3, 3.30. It was 5.30. And uh, I said, he, he was starting to bring out Crown Royal shots. And I said, brother, we got a two-hour ride home. Let's go. Uh, I don't know, what, time, what time is it? And I go, it's 5.30. He goes, oh, shit. I don't want to miss dinner. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, babe, yes. I think that was a good one to mess then. I'll bet the next one off. <laughs> yeah, it was it was definitely interesting, yeah. to say the least. And Ricky, sure. what what are, you, what are you doing now? I I do um like I said, I do the the pay per view stuff for um for Carlos, and then I do a lot of help with um with Alpha and his uh, WXW here in uh, in. No, I, I'm sorry to jump in here, but I'm going to uh, Carlos yeah. is, is doing shows again down there doing pay per views. No, tell us a little bit about that. We miss out on that. Uh, yeah, he's uh, they're back, you know, they they suffered a lot with Hurricane Maria, which kind of destroyed the island. But right. they're right. down there and they're they're not running a full schedule, but they're running, you know, at least one, sometimes two every weekend now. And they're doing pay-per-views every three months. Wow. So they did their anniversary. And it was the first pay-per-view that they had done. And I had kind of convinced them to to do a pay-per-view because it was a 50 year anniversary. And I said, then you don't have to make it 49.95 and make it feasible for everybody. So they're at 1995. So that's cheap for a pay-per-view for people, but you got all the, you know, the Puerto Ricans in New York, obviously in Florida, Chicago, just everywhere. So they had a good buy rate on the, on the, um, on the pay-per-view. So they did the next one. They did good with that one. And now they're doing this third one here, and they got some outside talent coming in um, that's coming into the uh, the island. So that always attracts for him there. But yeah, he's starting to 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 go back and and, and build things up because it's the last of the territories. There's there's nobody else left. So you know, I'm I'm always partial to that because you know he always took care of me. It was always if I needed a place to go, all I had to do was just call him, and he would give me a date. So I help him out. You know, Eddie calls me, and I just go down there and. Do what I got to do. So it's a good deal. They, you know, they take they take care of me, so I can't complain. 
Well, Ricky, hey, th- thank you so much for coming on. I've I look- been looking forward to seeing you and, and uh, having yep. you on the show, and, and it's great to see you and, and catch up with you. Mr. Briscoe talks about you all the time. Uh, he probably <laughs> yeah. he, probably because he wants to rib you some more, which he does. Oh, every- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always a rib. He always, you know, I know that he pulls the rib that it's his birthday so he can get free beer at every reunion. That we have every three months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every, every year, I go in, I don't tell anybody, but it's my birthday. And I always get somebody that believes me, and I always get yeah. a bucket of beer put in front of me. So. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a hundred, 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 118 years old my last count. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's all in good nature. We have a good time. We reminisce. And it's like we never left. You know, it's like we're still in the locker room and still young. We still got hair on our head. And wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where, <laughs> hair on your head. I'll be 65 Tuesday. Well, good for you. Happy birthday, awesome. my brother. Thank you. Well, uh, when yeah. is your birthday? What, what what date? What what date is it? 21st, November 21st. 21st. I'm the 29th. How are you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, with uh, Alpha. Alpha's the 21st. Uh, Shane Douglas is the 21st, who was a tag team partner of mine. And, of course, the Bella Twins, which is the ace in the hole. <laughs> well, I, exactly. I, I'm with uh, Dutch Mantel, Jerry Lawler, and Dana Brooke. So, uh, oh, okay. That's so you my, went Memphis route. <laughs> that's right. I got, I got Memphis absolutely covered. For sure, for sure. That's a, that's a definite. But, yeah, it's uh, 65 young. I can invert it, though, still. So I'm 56. How about that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hey, hey, at 70 years old, I had Norman Smiley give me my last match at a high spot in the ring of that international high spot, too. Oh, now I had an arm drag. <laughs> oh, well, and, and, and when, when you see Norman, John, you'll be seeing him in Orlando to tell him to work on his hip toss. Okay. <laughs> hey, I heard that you've made some improvements in your style. And he'll probably go, well, it's time. I go, yeah, your hip toss. From what I heard, Briscoe says, you need to work on it just a little bit more. <laughs> Norman's the best. He just laughs. He, he just, yeah. He's just a pleasant guy. Yeah, he is. He's just down to earth, man. I always kid him. He said, you're too nice to be in this business. What's wrong with you? Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Well, Ricky, man, we sure appreciate your time today. Tell that tell that, uh, that wild man Haku hello. And he's I will coming. do that. He's- well, you know anything when his book is dropping, when his book is coming out? Because he promised as soon as that book drops, he's on our show. Yeah, he, um, he's he been working on it. I don't know when exactly it's going to drop. I'm trying to get mine finished by um, January. You, you have uh, a book coming out, too. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, and I need you to do the preface for me, if you would. What? I said I need you to do the preface for me. If oh, you okay, want. okay, cool. I can't write, but I'll be glad to do it. Well, you can dictate it, and then I'll just put. It I, in I, there. I can, I can send smoke signals, and you can decipher. <laughs> yeah, so three smoke signals, six beers, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no brown liquor, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot, my friend. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you, John. Thank you.